hello and welcome uh, all my dear friends and all the eminent speakers of today's session so we are here today for the third day of maharana pratap annual security dialogue and uh, it's the last day of all our virtual sessions it has been a great journey so far we got some really amazing speakers and panelists over the last two days and they came out with some really enlightening ideas and like, the thoughts about what's going to be the future of uh, things happening after the taliban's revival and some people spoke on the community engagement in dealing with terrorism and then the, dr malikanti spoke on how to rehabilitate a terrorist there were sessions on terror financing dr tal pavel from israel had joined so we had a very good mix of practitioners and academicians uh, contemplating upon the diverse aspects of terrorism and how to deal with the, this problem in the future today we are here for the third session and the first session is one of a very very interesting topic the role of think tanks in counter terrorism that's something very dear to young scholars and students because uh, it's uh, these days i mean especially in india we see that people are getting very interested in this field and then then they may want to make a good career i was at cornell in the us and we always thought about uh, like after our masters uh, just entering into great think tanks based in dc and make a good career in this field okay? so i think it's something uh, this topic first it is very dear to me also to the young generation and uh, from here i'll just hand over to aprajita our moderator for today's session she'll be introducing the speakers but before that uh, just a small announcement uh, i hear that uh, uh, some of our participants were facing problem with cisco webex uh, normally people use zoom for web conferences but cisco webex is also a very very popular medium for uh web meetings and we have been using it for last uh, two years in fact and uh, in this uh, session uh, in this conference we had participants from various countries and they could log in so uh, sometimes it just uh, if there is any issue maybe it's because of uh, the wrong link or something like that okay, but uh, uh, it can be sorted out and secondly uh, the international P uh, participants who tried to register through our uh, paypal wallet they faced a problem that uh, they could not use the international cards that's because of a technical problem in india we are a non profit organization and uh, uh, to accept international payments we have to seek uh, the prior government approval so that uh, process is still pending so th this is the reason why we uh, we could not allow the international cards but we can accept payments through the paytm wallet which is why we had clearly written that in the registration form that uh, please uh, try to make your payments to the paytm wallet uh, but still uh, we are very sorry for any inconvenience if uh, our international participant faced in registration okay and thank you so much for joining over to you aprajita thank you abhinav um welcome all to the third day of the dialogue session 1 module 1 will focus on the role of think tanks and research in counter terrorism I'm Aparajita Banerjee from Astrid Research and Advisory Services Private Limited and your moderator for this session. For years, think tanks have emerged as curated platforms focused on disseminating information to the wider community. However, as organizations involved in policy research and advocacy, think tanks in the past and in many ways still continue to operate in a complex environment amidst academic institutions, government and the media. In line with the popular notion of think tanks influencing both government and community responses to security threats, Mr. Rohan Gunaratna, one of our keynote speakers as well, stated that, quote, to counter violent extremism, over 100 think tanks are currently engaged in teaching, research, networking and outreach activities. However, one can also argue that if countering violent extremism is a discipline, it should be based at an academic institution else it may lack the necessary theoretical and methodological rigor and that interdisciplinary approach, which is quite relevant in today. Um, we would like to explore the concepts in depth and perspectives with our speakers for the session and get an understanding about the role think tanks play in countering extremist ideology and assisting communities to ultimately build social resilience. At the outset, I would like to welcome and introduce our speakers for the session. Um, Dr. Trisha Bacon, welcome. Dr. Bacon is an associate professor at American University's School of Public Affairs. She also directs the policy anti-terrorism hub at American University. Dr. Bacon has authored Why Terrorist Organizations Form International Alliances, published by University of Pennsylvania Press in 2018. Prior to that, Dr. Bacon worked on counterterrorism over 10 years 
at the Department of State, including in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research, the Bureau of Counterterrorism, and the Bureau of Diplomatic Security. Dr. Bacon's work on counterterrorism in the intelligence community received numerous accolades with a focus on South Asia and Africa. I'd also like to welcome um, and introduce Dr. Ellie Carmen. Welcome. Dr. Carmen is Dr. Carmen is a senior research scholar at the International Institute for Counterterrorism, ICT, at Reichman University, former IDC, Herzliya, Israel, where he lectures on international terrorism and CBRN terrorism at the, I'm assuming that's Masters of Arts Counterterrorism Studies. He also served as an advisor to the Israeli Ministry of Defense and to the Anti-Semitism Monitoring Forum of the Israeli Government Secretariat. In the interest of time, uh, speakers are requested to adhere to the time limit of 12 to 15 minutes, and participants are reminded to mute themselves for the convenience of others. So with that, um, over to you, Dr. Bacon. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening from, from Washington, D.C. Good morning there in, in India. It is, it is quite cold and late here in Washington, but I'm very glad to be here. I'm especially glad to be here with Dr. Carmon whose uh, research has been really influential, especially when I was looking at, at terrorist group um, cooperation behavior. Uh, I've been asked to, as we discuss, speak about the role of research and think tanks in counterterrorism policy. And given my background as an academic and former US government official, my remarks will mostly be focused on how research and think tanks have influenced counterterrorism policy in the United States. And I do want to talk, of course, about research and think tanks, which uh, is a major source of, of research for counterterrorism policy, but also touch on the role of policy relevant research in academia. So what I'd like to talk about in the time that I have is some of the major ways that I see research as influencing US counterterrorism policy, as well as some of the hurdles that is hindering the ability of research to influence counterterrorism policy, and then conclude on some with some reflections on the way forward. So first, I wanted to talk about the major ways that I see research and think tanks influencing US counterterrorism policy. Uh, in particular, I would point to six major ways. First, in the United States system, pulling people from think tanks, academia, and the expert community to go into government is a major way that presidential administration staff professional political positions. And this has traditionally been the case, and it's certainly been the case with the Biden administration. But under the Trump administration, we realized how much this could vary. This was not a major way that the Trump administration sought to staff counterterrorism positions. And so I think there's some outstanding questions about how future administrations will, will treat these kinds of positions within the US government. The second way that research influences US counterterrorism policy, or really national security policy writ large, is through an array of programs that have been put in place on both the government and the research and think tank side to try to link the two. The relationship between them does not occur automatically. There has to be concerted efforts to link them. On the US government side, there are a number of programs that draw on researchers as experts to weigh in on interagency deliberations, on policies, or to review analysis. The US government provides grants for research, such as the Department of Defense's Minerva program. And on the academic side, there have been a number of efforts, especially in Washington, to develop programs that help to teach researchers how to speak to the policy community, such as the Bridging the Gap Initiative and the center that I had direct, which is the Policy Anti-Terrorism Hub. The third way that I've seen research influencing policy is when scholars are undertaking activities that the US government can't or, or won't undertake. And one of the areas that this has been particularly prominent is when scholars are undertaking field researchers, field work in places that are not readily accessed by the US government. And particularly since the Benghazi attack, the US presence overseas has been far more risk adverse and scholars have been an important way to get uh, perspective from the field and to talk to people that the US government is not readily able to access. Scholars are also undertaking more cutting at it edge experiments or surveys, and those results have been of increasing interest to the U.S. counterterrorism policy community. The fourth way I've seen is that think tanks in particular are facilitating track 1.5 and track 2 dialogues. And these dialogues are really critical ways that experts from the think tank community can use their research to inform discussions with their counterparts from other countries. 
The fifth way that I see think tanks and academic research as influencing policy comes through the array of outlets that are now prominent with the United States, like foreign policy, foreign affairs, war on the rocks, the monkey cage in the Washington Post, and others. There is a really competitive market of publications that are intended for researchers to be able to convey their work in a way that is conducive to busy counterterrorism policymakers. And then six, and perhaps least tangibly, I see that research from think tanks and sometimes academia are helping to generate new thinking and really challenge some of the established thinking that has been uh, created over the last 20 years in the US government on counterterrorism. But while we have these number of routes that research can influence counterterrorism policy, there are some important challenges, especially growing challenges in the United States. One of those is the growing challenge of the polarization of the environment within the United States. And that has really reached into the research um, and think tank environment. Of course, a lot of the think tanks in Washington have declared political leadings. And in this politically divided environment, really that has become heightened and there is less review of research or consideration of research when people are working on different sides of the political spectrum. And even researchers who are seeking to be objective and not political find that their work is often becoming politicized. Second, within the United States, there is some legitimacy problems that are occurring within think tanks as a result of questions about where they're getting their funding and the level of transparency they have about where their funding has come from. There have even been calls to increase disclosure requirements for think tanks in Washington, especially if think tanks are accepting money from foreign sources or sources that could be considered conflicts of interest. Another hurdle that I'm seeing is the ability of research to influence policy has been hindered by insufficient attention to the political realities, especially within Washington right now. And oftentimes research is not being timed in a way that corresponds with policy decision-making cycles. There is a, a pretty laborious policy decision-making cycle in Washington. And once decisions are made, it's unlikely that they're going to be revised or reviewed when new research comes out. So researchers really face hurdles in making sure that they're getting their research out in a way that is timed with policy-making decisions. Fourth, and this uh, was alluded to earlier, is the, the orientation still, of especially the US academic system. The US academic system still really prioritizes publications and academic journals, which are really outlets that are almost never read by policymakers. Policy engagement is still not encouraged in many universities, both for students and for faculty. And the focus is really still on measures like what journal are you getting your publications in? How many citations is your work receiving? Rather than emphasizing the impact that research is having on the real world and on counterterrorism problems. Another hurdle is in this environment, policymakers, counterterrorism policymakers in particular, are inundated with information and they're often reacting to crises, which makes it difficult for research to get their attention. They constantly have too much to read, and sometimes research is not being written in a way that is readily accessible to them or that they have time to digest. And finally, in our efforts as researchers to really push into difficult questions, it sometimes means that the research can have conflicting findings or scope conditions that make it difficult for policymakers to utilize it. One prominent example that comes to mind is on leadership decapitation. This is a topic that received significant attention amongst researchers for the last 20 years in particular. And there's a number of groups and cases and methods that have been used, but the result is a research literature that is really conflicting on questions about whether leadership decapitation reduces the threat or weakens a group or under what conditions it does so. And the result has been that policymakers are, are largely ignoring this really robust literature. And the question is much more about whether there's the ability to strike senior leadership rather than really assessing under what conditions that kind of strike will have the most counterterrorism effect. So that is all to say that I think there's important avenues for research and think tanks to influence counterterrorism policy, but also some pretty significant hurdles. And I would say that in the United States, we are at a transition point in terms of the impact of research on counterterrorism policy for a couple of reasons. First, the change in, na in national security priorities has really been cemented, especially in recent years. 
Counterterrorism now falls well behind other considerations, particularly, of course, great power competition. And that means that there's less time and attention and funding for research on counterterrorism. Second, within the counterterrorism research community in the United States, there has been a distinct shift in terms of attention and policy focus, and that is to look primarily at terrorism within the United States and the rise of the far right. And the policy environment and the policy options available really change significantly once a researcher is looking at counterterrorism recommendations within the United States versus international counterterrorism recommendations. And finally, I would say that there is a, a growing fatigue and maybe even some backlash to the counterterrorism approaches of the last 20 years. And researchers are having to grapple with some of that fatigue, both amongst policymakers and, and the US public in general. So I think going forward in order for research to really continue to impact counterterrorism policy in the United States, scholars both in think tanks and academia and elsewhere are really gonna have to operate within this new and changing reality. So with that, I will conclude and hope I stayed within my, my time limit and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Bacon. Um, over to you, Dr. Carmen, with your remarks on the topic. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this important conference. And I'm privileged because uh, I remember uh, uh, very well my visit in 2004 to Daipur, uh, your wonderful city, and I uh, regret only that this uh, conference is not uh, with a physical presence in uh, Udaipur. Uh, I will speak uh, about this uh, uh, issue of uh, think tanks in the field of terrorism and counterterrorism. Uh, from the point of view of a uh, member of uh, one of these think tanks, the ICT, International Institute for Counterterrorism, which was formed in uh, 1996. And uh, it was at that time uh, really a pioneer think tank because it was completely devoted to the study uh, of terrorism and counterterrorism. And uh, uh, by the way, it was quite uh, difficult at the beginning to be. Uh, accepted not only in the academic uh, academic uh, uh, field, but also uh, by the Israeli establishment, which was not, uh, the difference with the American establishment was not uh, accustomed to such kind of uh, uh, input by uh, academic uh, uh, institutions. Uh, at uh, that time, in 1996, there was a very strange uh, situation. The study of terrorism, uh, theoretical terror study, began already in the 70s. And there were uh, a quite a large number of specialists, especially in the United States, like Professor uh, Martha Crenshaw, like uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Walter Reich, and David Rappaport, Michael Stoll, Brian Jenkins, which everybody, I hope, uh, knows. Uh, and also in Europe, Professor Paul Wilkinson and uh, uh, Professor Donatella Dan Porta in Italy. But there was no institutions or think tanks dealing only with uh, ter terrorists beside one project at St. Andrews University in Scotland. And many of the people which began their uh, uh, studies began in St. Andrews, including, for instance, uh, Rohan Gunaratno, that you probably know and will be a participant here, or uh, Bruce uh, Hoffman, which is also known as international. And uh, uh, therefore, it was uh, strange again that before 9-11, you didn't have any organization that dealt specifically with the, uh, with the uh, uh, issue. I will tell you that, for instance, the, the project that the Rand Corporation, which worked for the Pentagon and the American Army especially, they received uh, from uh, the American Air Force $8 million in uh, 1997, 1998, after the attack, uh, terrorist attack, and their uh, Air Force uh, uh, American Air Force uh, officers and soldiers in Kobar Tower in Saudi Arabia. And uh, uh, when the uh, director of this project began to work, he came to Israel in order to try to understand how to work uh, as a think tank on the issue of uh, uh, terrorism. So uh, our institute was formed in 1996 as an independent, apolitical, uh, and non subversion uh, organization. In the framework, uh, the only framework that accepted at the time, it was the Interdisciplinary Center in Etzlia, which today is the Reichman University. And this was during the peace process between Israel and the Palestinians. But at the same time, at the height of the uh, wave of suicide terrorism inside is Israel during this uh, peace process. Uh, in 1987, the ICT 
opened the first uh, internet site in English. At that time, it was the only one which had an open database on incidents of terrorism all over the world. And uh, this made uh, us uh, very quickly known all over the world and uh, gave courses in uh, uh, schools and in, in university about terrorism. For instance, because of the wave of uh, suicide terrorism, there was a problem of resilience of our young generation. They didn't understand why uh, schools and uh, why uh, young people were killed in this, such kind of terrorism. So we opened a resilience project together with the Minister, Minister of Education. So you understand that also how, what was our doctrine, how trying to uh, use our uh, knowledge and our understanding in order to prepare the public, in this case, the young public, uh, to the threat of terrorism, mainly on the psychological and political side. And also, we began at that time in the 90s, uh, before 9-11, to give courses to the elite troops of the uh, Israeli army, because it appeared that uh, the uh, Israeli intelligence uh, uh, entity, military intelligence, did not give courses on this issue, and many officers, young officers, did not understand how exactly or why they were fighting, for instance, in, against Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon. And I, as a professor of university, I had students which wanted to understand better what is exactly Hezbollah, uh, what is the Iranian and Syrian activity uh, inside uh, Lebanon. And uh, 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 also, uh, little by little, we began to uh, uh, be involved in projects for our own establishment. Uh, and uh, uh, beginning with the police, uh, then with the security service and uh, uh, Ministry of uh, Transport and uh, uh, so on. For instance, also the uh, first research in Israel on CBRM terrorism, chemical, biological, uh, metallurgical, and nuclear, was uh, <coughs> uh, incentivated by our contacts with the uh, uh, the, with the uh, Israel Prime Minister. Uh, uh, advisor on terrorism, which did not even know that there is not such kind of project in Israel. And interestingly, this was also the first international cooperation project because it was done in the framework of the Israeli-French uh, strategic dialogue with the Minister of Defense of uh, France. And the French uh, uh, think tank involved in it uh, began this kind of, uh, of uh, research together with us, and after two years, we presented reports to our two ministers of defense on this very sensitive issue just before 9-11. It was finished just before 9-11. And by the way, we at that time predicted that there will not be, uh, in a short term, will not be a successful uh, CBRN terrorism attack, and it happened only on 9-11 uh, inside the United States, the anthrax attacks. Uh, in the United States itself, only after 9-11, we saw the beginning of formation of these centers of excellence, what else, uh, they are called, uh, because the Homeland Defense Secret, uh, uh, Department, which was uh, a new organization, uh, combining a lot of other entities uh, dealing with security and uh, counterterrorism in the United States, they financed uh, 10, 10 centers of excellence in the various, uh, in the various uh, uh, universities around the uh, United States, and uh, there are today 10 centers of uh, excellence in uh, this framework and ten, uh, six emeritus centers of excellence. And uh, among them, for instance, you know, the START uh, uh, think tank, which is uh, a very important one, uh, leading uh, the research on the uh, uh, terrorism at Maryland University. I think a lot of practitioners and especially academicians uh, know it. Uh, it is led by the University of Maryland and provides policymakers and practitioners with empirically grounded findings on the human elements of the terrorist threat and informs decisions on how to disrupt terrorist and terrorist groups. By the way, the National Memorial Institute for the Prevention of Terrorism in Oklahoma City, which was the place where the first the big uh, terrorist attack uh, by radical uh, uh, cell in uh, Oklahoma was in 1995, uh, became for the beginning a memorial, but then an institute which conducts research into the developments of technologies in counter biological, nuclear and chemical weapons of mass destruction and cyber terrorism. And ICT, by the way, which was already an old institution at the time, uh, gave advice to the leaders of this uh, new uh, institute in Oklahoma. There is, by the way, a NATO center of excellence for defense against terrorism in Ankara, in Turkey. 
the center acts as an advisory body to allied command transformations on terrorism and the counter-terrorism related issues, and it has relations with allied command operations, the ACO, and are typically coordinated by the ACT. Additionally, uh, this uh, organization or entity or think tank establishes relationships with numerous NATO bodies and non-NATO entities as well. It is uh, designated uh, as a complement to NATO's current uh, research resources, while also serving as NATO's department head in education and training for counterterrorism. By the way, uh, myself and several of our colleagues uh, were lecturers at this uh, center in Ankara until 2010-2011 when uh, the political crisis between Israel began. And unfortunately, although it is a NATO uh, institution, they stopped to invite us uh, to Turkey uh, because also, by the way, in the framework of uh, NATO, Turkey tried to stop the, uh, uh, the participation of Israeli uh, IDF and Israeli academicians in the work of NATO. Uh, ACT and other think tanks participate also in the various European research uh, multinational consortium projects, known as the Horizon Project. And for instance, for the last uh, uh, three, four years, our institute was involved in two uh, projects involving uh, the study of radicalization. One is called Trivalent, and the other one Red Alert, and we are also participating in various other uh, uh, such kind of uh, consortiums. Apologies, uh, Dr. Carmen, thing. could we um, request you to please conclude your remarks? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so there are less think tanks in Europe, but I would like to uh, speak about the ICT cooperation with Indian institution. Uh, first, we had uh, cooperation with IDSA, which is a known institution close to the Indian Ministry of Defense, uh, through their strategic uh, uh, cooperation with uh, the PESA uh, think tank at Baralan University. And I was the representative of ICT in this uh, framework of strategic studies. And as a result, I visited IDSA conferences in 2004 and 2012. The India Foundation, the ICT has an MOU with the India Foundation, and we participated in each other event. And last year, we organized the India-Israel Cyber Terrorism Dialogue with the participation of our respective ambassadors and directors of National Cyber Bureau. And finally, the ORF, Observer Research Foundation, which which are partnered in the framework of the Global Internet Forum to counter terrorism. Uh, and by the way, Dani Carmon, the former Israeli ambassador to India, is today uh, ICT fellow, and he is dealing and leads several programs with uh, a nexus between counterterrorism, cooperation, and diplomacy. The last two uh, things I must mention that we had a very important relationship with the media because we think that we must influence decision makers and the uh, public, uh, public, not only on Israeli issues or regional issues, but on global terrorism. So, therefore, exactly, we are international institute. institute. And also, uh, there is an issue that uh, perhaps uh, I will have time later to explain. We are, from time to time, we are channels for political messages from uh, other countries' uh, leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carmen, for that remark and very elaborate um, explanation. Uh, we have a couple of questions over here, and they pretty much highlight uh, certain keywords such as transparency and credibility and the, um, the role that think tanks are playing, which is very much in line with what we're discussing right now. So to both our speakers, um, this is a question where you can quickly have a discussion on. So in, in counterterrorism, access to information is usually difficult to come across as discussed already. Intelligence agencies do not readily share information and terror groups are secretive. So on top of that, there is no fixed or structured methodology in research and it's difficult to interview authentic sources. So do you think this field can be credible for academic research or it's another, for lack of a better word, a pseudo research domain that intelligence agencies and other stakeholders with vested interests use for managing perceptions and shaping policy discourses? Risha, you want to begin or so? Go ahead, Dr. Carmon. Okay. Uh... The doctrine of think tanks, uh, uh, at least uh, at ICT, is that we are based ourselves only on open sources. Uh, very rarely uh, we are dealing with research for some uh, establishment uh, uh, entity uh, on secret information, uh, but this is again uh, very, very rare. 
uh, our from our experience uh, until today, we know that the uh, uh, establishment state uh, agencies have a problem with dealing with strategic analysis. Uh, they are so much involved and busy with the everyday uh, fight against terrorism on the operational and tactical level that they don't have the resources and sometimes they didn't don't have even I would say the fantasy to make evaluations on the strategic level. And little by little, uh, we saw in Israel and I was uh, also abroad because we are dealing with uh, uh, projects for establishment in Israel, as I said, but also abroad, including to intelligence agencies, courses, and uh, also uh, seminars. And uh, uh, because they understood that we can provide information, today, 95% of the intelligence is open sources. Uh, the uh, issue is, how you obtain these sources, how do you decide that this is a important uh, information that is a reliable information. Uh, and we, for instance, uh, at our institute, we have a special team, which is called the Monitoring Jihadi Groups, where we enter uh, forums of uh, jihadi groups all over the world. Uh, and then we analyze not only open information that is published uh, uh, quite uh, uh, clearly by these organizations, but from time to time, we found information which is uh, is uh, specific. I would say, for instance, that uh, is very example. Before 9/11, uh, studying the Taliban 14 14 websites uh, in 14 languages, uh, many of them were dealing with the Chechen war, and we obtained information from these uh, websites that the Chechens were trying to attack Israeli and Jewish uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, targets. Uh, because they wanted uh, to uh, be solidar with the Hamas at that time, and also to be financed by the, uh, some of the Gulf countries. Uh, and we provided this information to our security service, uh, which uh, they didn't uh, know because they did not uh, follow, they did not monitor these uh, websites. And this is only one, one example. From time to time, we have uh, uh, even alert information, uh, uh, which gives uh, hints to the establishment what it can be done. Trisha, you take. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I agree with a number of the points that, that Dr. Carmon made. I, I would say that the, as somebody who worked on the government side and the research side, that they're actually complementary and each one is incomplete without the other. But this is not a realm that's just somehow only applicable to sort of the spies and, and the secretive information. Um, as Dr. Cremon said, so much of intelligence is open source at this point, and there's a lot of denied areas from an intelligence perspective that require reliance on open source information. And in addition, oftentimes people who are working in intelligence, especially on the counterterrorism side, are really driven by crises and threat. And research is able to take this broader step back to look at things in a more strategic way, a more generalizable way, in a longer term way. So um, I would say that it's, it's absolutely not only is it a, a legitimate field, it's actually a very important one, especially in an environment of growing polarization and, and potential for political violence. I would uh, ask, uh, I'll add also that uh, at our institute, we have what we call associates, uh, several doses, former heads of the, all the intelligence uh, uh, agencies, the Mossad, the military intelligence, the police, and so on. and heads of the departments dealing with uh, counter-terrorism in these agencies, because they understand that after leaving the establishment, uh, they want to give some input uh, and participate in our sessions, in uh, brainstorming sessions, but in, even uh, sometimes in projects. And they gave the example of uh, former ambassador, uh, Daniel Carbon, Danny Carbon, uh, but there are others uh, which participate in uh, seminars that we organize, for instance, what Israel should do uh, with Hezbollah in Lebanon. Three day seminar with very important people, all of them from outside the establishment, but many are practitioners, including those which work at uh, uh, ICT that have uh, some uh, former background with the agencies or the uh, uh, establishment, but at the same time, they have a good academic preparation. I, Patricia, for instance, working uh, in Washington. Thank you, Tricia and uh, Ellie, for the. Uh of answering the questions. We'd like to now go to the chat. And um, just before that, I believe David has a question. So I'm just wondering whether you'd like to uh, maybe post it in the chat or would you like to just quickly ask your question by okay. unmuting yourself? 
I've just unmuted. Can you hear me? We can. Yes, go for it. Thanks. Great. Um, so, since I know the ICT investor extremely, we need almost every conference there for over 10 years. Uh, um, the, the question is more to Tricia. Can you give good and bad examples of the relationship be between the think tank community and policymakers, and in particular, uh, is there a level of distrust of think tanks among policymakers because of the, the financing and sometimes the ideology behind the think tanks? And by the way, can you also relate to other countries outside the USA? Thank you. I, I think I may have had a little bit of a break up there, but I think I got the, the gist of, of your question. Um, and I think in terms of your question about distrust, trust and distrust, I would say that in, in the United States, the previous administration, the Trump administration, I had a pretty deep distrust of the think tank and sort of um, policy expert community. And that was one of the reasons why we didn't see them pull a, a number of people into the government from, from the, those um, cadre of experts. I would I wouldn't say that the Biden administration has uh, distrust for the think tank community writ large, but I think you have identified something that's lingering that I don't think has been resolved to to some policymakers' dissatisfaction. Le less so in the counterterrorism realm, but but more broadly, and that is concerns about foreign funding, um, especially governments that may be seeking to influence um, opinions and policies in the United States. And think tanks are not supposed to be lobbyists, right? And so the the idea of making sure that these are distinct functions, and that the research that that think tanks maybe they do have an ideological leaning, but that they are they are not being influenced by those kinds of considerations. I do think there is concern uh, amongst policymakers about that, but I have not seen it as being as pronounced in the counterterrorism realm. Um, I would say that there is some concerns about China and about. Um, some golf funding in those policy realms, but I'm not sure I can come up with a good, a good example and a bad example off the top of my head, although I'm sure I will as soon as we, we move on to another topic. But I would defer to um, Dr. Carmona about the situation in, in Israel, and I, I wouldn't say I'm as familiar with think tanks in, in other places outside of the United States, so I wouldn't be as well positioned to speak on that. Maybe, maybe you can speak on that from, from, a, from your perspective as well. And there is a problem. Um, Sorry, can I please? Uh, there is a problem uh, in this uh, uh, field when uh, the uh, think tank has a political coloration. Okay, ICT, as I said, is a completely independent apolitical organization. We are not by doctrine financed by the government. We are financed either by donations uh, or by uh, many projects uh, which are helping us. To uh, produce other projects, and uh, when we are preparing a, a project for a Israeli, for instance, Israeli institution, we give recommendations, but we are not responsible if these recommendations are accepted or followed by the government. There are institutes, for instance, in Israel, the Besa uh, Center, which is considered to be uh, a rightist, uh, uh, if you want, think tank, or the INSS, which is considered to be center or center left. So clearly, some people in the government can accept or not accept the uh, uh, discussions or the papers that these institutes are uh, providing, uh, first of all, to the public opinion, and then also from time to time to the government itself. Uh, but this is a decision by the politicians. If they accept uh, the ob objectivity uh, of this kind of research, and we are trying, first of all, to be objective, okay? Even with uh, we think, and by the way, we see our responsibility uh, to try to engage the government in issues that they are not following as we think should follow. As I said, on the strategic level, many times the establishment is not prepared in all the fields. So we see our inf uh, influence and importance when we give new ideas or new recommendations uh, for the government, including, by the way, to other governments in Europe, uh, when we participate in European uh, European uh, projects. Thanks, Tricia and Ellie. Um, could we just uh, switch to the chat uh, questions, if that's okay with both of you? And we have a question from uh, Preet Chohanpreet. Uh, 
Um, okay, and this is for Trisha Bacon, but I'm sure you both would have some responses for this. So the question is, much policy outreach by think tanks is done behind the scenes in private off the record briefings that are not touted publicly. An inherent risk is that policymakers will seek out think tanks views that validate rather than question parts that have been predetermined or already taken. So what are your views on that? Or do you kind of agree or a different course? I think there, I think there is a risk of that. I think there is a risk of that. On the other hand, I, I don't in a way that there isn't even really an incentive to reach out if you're just looking for confirmation. Uh, the, our policy process is so demanding and encompassing that if, if you're simply looking to be valid, if policymakers are simply looking to be validated, I don't know that they have to reach out. So if they're going to reach out, it, it is probably to make sure that there isn't something that they uh, didn't consider. And I would make sort of a distinction between the political orientation of think tanks and, and the research orientation. Um, and that is to say that, of course, administrations may be more prone to reach out to think tanks that share their ideological meaning, but that the way that that produces policy recommend, recommendations and around like counterterrorism isn't necessarily as, as clearly predictable along ideological lines. Um, so I, I think that in my experience with this, I don't I don't find that policymakers are necessarily reaching out to only those that they want that, that are going to validate their views, but just because they reach out and get alternative views doesn't mean that they're going to act on them either. Maybe they want to hear them and make sure they get that perspective, but I'm not sure it necessarily changes the policy outcome, uh, Some at least a, a good portion of the time that I, I've had experience with that. Your views, uh, Dr. Carmen? I see a question about uh, Chinese influence on think tanks. Uh, I can uh, uh, testify that we had very good relationship uh, with uh, Chinese uh, counterparts uh, before 9-11 and after 9-11, but not in the last years. And uh, I can uh, uh, give an example that before 9-11, when the first visit of uh, uh, the Chinese uh, special experts on counterterrorism to ICT, uh, they told us, for instance, about 56 suicide bombings that happened in China that were never published at that time. Uh, so they were aware. And for instance, uh, when the Center for Counterterrorism Studies at the Chichir uh, famous university, which works practically for the CCP, for the Chinese Communist Party, uh, was formed in April 2001, before 9-11, they were happy that they took example from our studies or from our uh, sensitivity to the issue of terrorism and open this institute before 9-11. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that they uh, advanced their studies, by the way, uh, uh, at that time, uh, until the uh, uh, Olympic Games, when I was uh, uh, in the United Nations team, which gave advice for the preparation of security at uh, uh, Beijing Olympics in 2008, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, entities which studied the Middle East were not so well prepared uh, about the jihadist uh, threat, uh, including the inside Xinjiang itself, uh, where there were uh, Uyghur terrorists already uh, active since the mid-90s. Uh, 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 there is another uh, issue in our case that uh, the Gulf countries have invested a lot in institutes, especially American institutes. And you have today in the uh, uh, United Arab Emirates or in uh, Qatar, uh, branches of almost all American uh, American uh, important institutes, uh, and in the Washington, I know uh, specifically from uh, some of my colleagues that there's a lot of investment by Gulf countries in uh, uh, projects and uh, institutes which are dealing with the Middle East. And on the long run, I think uh, this could be uh, a problem uh, because clearly there are interests of these uh, uh, countries in order to. Uh, influence uh, the uh, uh, publications and the recommendations of these institutes. Do you have any views on that, Trisha? It's, uh, it's a last question regarding the infiltration of think tanks by Chinese funds. I think it's at um, the point I made earlier about one of the, the hurdles that it that we're experiencing right now, and that is the questions. And, I, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that I think people in the think tank community in Washington, D.C. are are feel that some of these accusations are um, overblown, but it is definitely a 
concern and a perception. And I think this gets at uh, questions about how to ensure that there's sufficient transparency about where funds are coming from, both on a specific project level and then at, at an institution level. I mean, these are these are not inexpensive uh, institutes to run. There has to be an element of fundraising to them. There ha and sometimes that fundraising will um, come from outside the United States. But I do think that in order to um, allay some of these concerns, there there is a, a push for their much more transparency. And I think that that could that could alleviate some of the concern that there is this kind of influence going on that people aren't know that they don't know about it or that they're insufficiently informed about. And so I, I do think that that is a, a pretty uh, a pretty serious consideration, especially when, as I say, national security wise from for the US, great power competition is is the priority. And if one of the major um, influences on research in Washington is are, are the Chinese trying to uh, influence think tank research, that that has pretty serious implications. So even if some of these accusations are exaggerated, undertaking a level of transparency to ensure that people are assured by it seems like a common sense next step. Thanks, Trisha. So we have um, a question from Abhinav. Uh, yep. Thank you very much, Dr. Trisha and uh, Dr. Eli Carmel uh, for sharing your thoughts on the very critical subject. So I have a question that uh, in the Western think tanks, we don't uh, get to read uh, much about the, the terror groups uh, operating on the behalf of Pakistan in Kashmir, like Hezbollah Mujahideen or even Jaish Muhammad. Like Hezbollah Mujahideen is one of the most brutal terror group, uh, but uh, I mean, it's quite shocking that only in 2017 it was delisted or blacklisted in the U.S. State by the U.S. State Department. But it has been functional for the last three decades as one of the most brutal organizations. When it comes to other uh, other groups like Al-Badr or Al-Faran, there's hardly any literature. So the only on Lashkar that Dr. Christine Fair wrote, and that was also after the 2008 uh, Mumbai attack uh, in which many uh, Americans also died in that war. So I mean, how would you explain that? And my second question also. So this uh, in in the recent uh, American withdrawal from Afghanistan. After that, uh, we saw that uh, you know it was just a matter of a few days that Taliban could get back to the power. But we I never came across any kind of a strategic forecasting by any of the think tanks. You know which could actually predict uh, to a certain degree that this would likely happen. Okay. Uh, please share your thoughts on these two things. I, I'm I'm happy to take a initial um, uh, crack at, at answering those two questions. Um, on your questions about Pakistani sponsored groups, I think that's an interesting question because it gets at what we were talking about uh, initially, which is that this is this kind of research is actually quite difficult to do. And one of the things that I think would be required to shed new light on Hezbollah Mujahideen or Jaish Muhammad or to a lesser extent Lashkar e Taiba is field research, right? The ability to, to uh, conduct field research in Pakistan or in Kashmir. And both of those are very difficult places to conduct field research. It's difficult to get access, it's difficult to uh, get the permissions needed. And I think that, uh, for example, Christine Fair was able to do spend extensive time in Pakistan for years before she published her book and get access to primary sources from Lashkar e Taiba in part in Pakistan. Um, and of course, that subsequently became more difficult. So I, I think that you're right that those are under researched areas and um, it would be useful for the there to be a more robust um, look at all of those organizations and no one would be more interested in that than me. So you're, you have fertile ground in, in that um, appeal. Um, I, I also think that you're right about the critique about strategic forecasting. And I would just speak from a US academic standpoint that, that we're not training students to and training researchers to do that kind of strategic forecasting. There's a lot of emphasis on methods, um, on how to make sure your methods are rigorous, but a lot of that research involves looking backwards um, and less of it involves looking forward and prediction. And I think that is one of the critical roles of think tanks in particular, as opposed to a lot of the, the academic research. Um, but I think that that's an area where we could do a better job 
providing training to people while they're getting PhD so that they can do more rigorous um, forecasting looking forward. Because of course that is something that's done within the US intelligence community. So I think that that, that is an area that there, there can and should be growth in some of the training that we do for researchers. Uh, if I can uh, uh, add, uh, I think that, uh, in my opinion, uh, I speak of our professional opinion, uh, Pakistan is one of the uh, main threats to international terrorism. It began with the support uh, to the Taliban uh, in the uh, 90s, uh, and today we see the same uh, phenomenon uh, reproducing itself uh, in Afghanistan, in the sense that the Pakistani intelligence services are supporting the most radical uh, branch, if you want, if you can speak about others moderate, in the field of the uh, Taliban leadership. Uh, most of the Taliban leadership uh, with uh, very important positions in the new uh, government are people which are supported, uh, are radical support by the uh, Pakistani intelligence. And in their relationship with China, there is a problem for the Chinese because the Chinese were always very, uh, very afraid of the activity of jihadists, especially Uyghur jihadists, and by, by the way, also Uzbek uh, jihadists, which strained the, the, the Uyghurs uh, inside Afghanistan. And who supported them after 9-11? Well, the United States. The United States were the one which arrested the, some 23, I think, Uyghurs that put them in Guantanamo. Uh, and only more later, later, the Pakistani tried to also to uh, fight against the uh, Uyghur terrorists. So this is a problem uh, which will continue to, to bother the Chinese relationship with the Pakistan, especially with what happens today in Afghanistan, as I said. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Tricia. I would just like to share that. So over the last three to four years, uh, I have done most of my field research in Kashmir. And uh, if anyone is interested in the Kashmir-related groups, uh, I wrote this book, uh, Radicalization in India and Exploration. And uh, I can share that now. I interviewed real-time militants, surrendered militants, hawala dealers, you know, coordinators, in present and the uh, retired intelligence officials, politicians, separatist leaders, even the religious clerics. And even people sitting on the other side of the border with working with the terror training camps and all so it's a very authentic work and in this uh, i wrote that in, I, I mean i did my field research mostly in 2018-17 and i predicted the i mean sort of you know during in this in my research in south kashmir we could find the symptoms of a suicide bombing trend emerging there and finally after five months that pulwama suicide bombing happened so if anyone is interested, you know, they can find a good material on jamaat e islami and how these terror groups operate in Kashmir. It's an entirely different model from the other parts of the world. They work in through multiple channels, through the media, through charities, and through even through the government official systems so, like that. And my next book is also coming on terror financing in Kashmir. Once again, based on the most authentic sources, people who were actually infiltrating militants from Pakistan into Kashmir, who were into the uh, weapons smuggling business so i interviewed those real time narcotic traders and smugglers and all it will be the book will be out uh, released by routledge and it's in the last stage of its publication so i mean definitely i'll send the links and also but in case if you want to currently if you want any work on kashmir this is the work which i have done so, and hopefully i think it'll just provide some inputs thank you very much okay. so we have uh, i guess uh, yeah it's 958 and uh, we can take one more question, and after that, uh, uh, Dr. Ayman Salama has joined. He'll be talking in brief about uh, uh, radicalization uh, theories because yesterday he was uh, uh, to join our session and he could not join because of some technical issues. So he'll be talking for like 10 minutes uh, after we, this session is over. So we can take one or two quick questions. Uh, Prajita, over sure, to you. Sure, thanks, Abhinav. Uh, there are questions in the chat Yes, box. thanks, Abhinav. There's one actually. Uh on the on the platform and one from the chat box so let's just have a combination so this one's from dr hashil mehta what role can strategic alliances like quad and bimstek play to counter the china's the chinese expansionism policy in the indo-pacific region that's the first one would you like me to just ask two questions and then you can kind of take would that be easier dr bacon and uh, dr palman or all right great so that's the first one and the second one is um from ambika bhargava Again, to China and Pakistan. Question is, can China and Pakistan be trust, trusted? The way they openly support global terrorists like 
Hafiz Said and Masood Azhar even in UNSC and other platforms. So these are the two main questions that we'd like to stick to and over to you, Dr. Carmon and Dr. Bacon. The issue of quad is an issue of uh, a great strategy, not of uh, terrorism. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm not a, a really a specialist, although I read about it and I try to understand what's uh, happening in the Southeast Asia in the conflict between the United States, Australia, Great Britain, uh, and India, by the way, and China. Uh, so I want uh, uh, I don't have an intelligence, uh, have a professional response to, to, to it. Uh, as about the Chinese uh, policy on counterterrorism, I think, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, China is not supporting uh, terrorist organizations. Perhaps it was uh, during the revolutionary, if you want, uh, a period of uh, the tricontinental, which was led, by the way, by Cuba, and it was, by the way, a kind of uh, competition between the Soviet Union at the time and Chinese uh, uh, Communist Party. Uh, there was support to uh, terrorists and mainly guerrilla groups, uh, either in Africa or in uh, South uh, Latin America. Uh, but uh, I think the uh, uh, Chinese government uh, uh, is very aware that terrorism is a, uh, could be a, a sword with two uh, sides. I mean, uh, this could lead to activity against uh, China. And we see, by the way, ISIS and uh, also Al Qaeda threatening uh, China more and more, including the last uh, attack, one of the last attacks in Afghanistan against the Kunduz uh, uh, Shia mosque, uh, which was done by a Uyghur uh, suicide bomber. And the ISIS uh, Khorasan, or IS Khorasan, uh, specifically uh, uh, claimed in their uh, claim of responsibility that this was uh, an operation against uh, China or Chinese influence inside Afghanistan. Trisha, any comments? Sure, I, I think I think uh, I I agree with Dr. Carmel's point about uh, the how to contain the expansion of China is is a beyond the scope of the counterterrorism issues that I I tend to look at. But on the question of counterterrorism and and whether to trust Pakistan, I would describe the mood in Washington as as um, having lost quite a bit of patience with with Pakistan. Um, I don't think that the environment, the policy environment here is one of trusting that Pakistan is going to take action on counterterrorism. It's the um, mood is much more at, to make the asks and then to verify that they've been done. Um, so I, I don't think that the, the mood in Washington, at least as far as I can see, it is one that is leaning towards trusting Pakistan on counterterrorism issues. It is it, the, the United States has learned some pretty painful and difficult lessons in Afghanistan about um, how how it needs to engage with the Pakistanis on some of these counterterrorism issues. Thank you, uh, Dr. Harmon and uh, Dr. Bacon, for the for answering the questions. I'm just wondering, Abhinav, whether do we have yes, time yes, for I, another I, question? I, no, I, I don't think you know. Uh, okay. I, I'm, I'm really sorry for not being able to take uh, more questions. You know, definitely, we would love to do that. You know, with such amazing thoughts from such insightful speakers, you know. Uh, but yes, we have Ayman Salama here. Uh, Dr. Ayman Salama, uh, please join in Sir. for sharing your thoughts on the Egyptian model of uh, counterterrorism and countering radicalization. Uh, yes, sir. Good morning, everybody. I would like first of all to thank uh, the steering committee, the organizing committee of the uh, such an important, uh, in my opinion, the, one of the most uh, important uh, uh, conferences or seminars that tackle terrorism in uh, on all sides. I would uh, focus and pluralize my intervention on the Egyptian model that countering and is still countering terrorism here in Egypt. Uh, first of all, the Egyptian government is still adapting and resorting to various mechanisms and instruments to combat terrorism. Egypt is dedicating actually her diplomatic efforts to counter terrorism, not only in Egypt, uh, on the local or the national level, but also abroad. Uh, when, when, when Egypt actually uh, 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 got its membership in the Global Counter-Terrorism Forum, and also formerly 
uh, her presidency of the United Nations Security Council Terrorism Committee in New York. Moreover, Egypt is relying on its military and police means in encountering terrorism organizations and the groups in Sinai in the eastern uh, uh, north of Egypt. Interestingly and substantially also, Egypt has been cooperating with the Iraqi government years ago and also with the International Coalition to counter ISIS uh, in Syria and Iraq. Uh, the uh, we, we, we have actually to uh, address the domestic terrorism in Egypt, which is uh, considered uh, the one of the imminent uh, threat uh, that uh, uh, jeopardizes the uh, national Egyptian security. President Sisi, president of Egypt, has been reiterating his uh, focus. Uh, and emphasize that the uh, fight against the local terrorist groups as a ferocious uh, war here in Egypt. The toppling of uh, the former uh, Marxist regime on the 30th June 2013, followed by the dispersal of Muslim brother sitting in Rabah al -Adawiyya, in uh, and also in Nahda Square in in Cairo on the 14th August uh, 2013 actually the main trigger the main trigger for a new wave of domestic uh, terrorism in Egypt which has been spreading in many modern urban cities on the mainland besides Sinai as I mentioned right now Speaking of this new wave does not overlook the fact that terrorism in Sinai is one is an old issue, but it makes it more complex and sophisticated due to the increasing militarism of the terrorists currently active there. For decades, the lack of development actually in Sinai and weak governance and the increasing influence of the Salafi jihadists, extremists group, turn it Sinai into a safe haven for their terrorist cells formed by radicalized indigenous Bedouin Arabs living in Egypt. Violent extremism is used widely in the West, but the concept of terrorism isn't applied in the case of Muslim brothers so as to undermine the efforts led by the Egyptian government to level the Muslim Brothers as a terrorist group. Currently, the most active organization in Sinai, named or called Ansar Bet al -Magdis. This terrorist organization announced its loyalty to ISIS in November 2014, and since then it has been labeled Wilayat Sinai. Wilayat, which means emirate or principality in the uh, Egyptian or in the Arabic language. It operates mostly in northern Sinai and is composed of Salafi jihadists. Besides being, besides being hierarchically well organized, experienced in terrorist operations and acts and having the capabilities, I mean the military capabilities and the machinery, the weaponry to carry out its numerous attacks following varying tactics. It is following the strategy of the hiring within the civilian communities in the villages of Northern Sinai. Consequently, the uh, combating or countering measures adopted by the police and army in Sinai became very and more sophisticated and complicated. The second category of terrorists belongs to the northern of leaderless terrorism, especially the small cells type. It is by definition homegrown, its members are citizens. I mean, Egyptian citizens who were not subject to a structured training on terrorism 
or in traditional training camps. And those groups were radicalized through being exposed to radical and extreme content disseminated through social media platforms or throughout direct communications with the extremists in mosques or other gatherings here in Egypt. Unlike the first type, these groups, I mean the second group, does not use religion to justify their violence and are not seeking to re-establish the Islamic Khalifa, I mean the religious uh, Muslim uh, system or regime, political regime. And instead, they use political justifications. The level of terrorism on the mainland and in northern Sinai is being, becoming unpredictable, especially with the increasing reliance on improvised explosive devices. Examining the total number of terrorist attacks in northern Sinai, and on the mainland here in Egypt revealed that the numbers are decreasing so much. Thus, the level of terrorism in northern Sinai and on the mainland was at its height in 2014 and also 2015 till now. During, and this is very important to remember that during the 80s and 90s last century, Egypt experienced a wave, a wave of terrorism which it attempted to counter. Most of the efforts were directed to the security strategies in countering the two main terrorist groups, Al Jihad and Al Jamaa Islamiyah. Those two groups, terrorist groups, were the two major terrorist groups that. Egypt had encountered in the 80s and 90s last centuries, as I mentioned. As the, as the current wave, the current wave of terrorism is different from that of the 80s and 90s in terms of the geographic areas affected and the type of terrorist organization, I claim that its complex nature is the main driver for adapting relatively new set of policies in comparison with those adopted before, despite the absence of an announced national strategy for countering terrorism, formally or officially speaking. The government's main approach is characterized by sweeping arrest campaigns throughout the country, broadened legal infrastructure language, uh, I mean, domestic legislations to remove barriers to neutralize the enemy. The enemy here in parentheses, the terrorist groups and broad and indiscriminate security operations in uh, Sinai. Uh, targeting actually the terrorists helping the victims and preventing the spread of terrorism are the uh, major uh, uh, policies, uh, mechanisms that Egypt had been adopted in the recent uh, few years. I would very uh, swiftly uh, tackle the, 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 the three uh, different dimensions of uh, targeting uh, those uh, uh, terrorist groups in just only one minute, sir. Targeting the terrorists, Egypt adopted policies aimed at weakening the terrorist groups, arresting those terrorists through maintaining a level of policing, collecting, and intelligence, and bringing them, the terrorists, of course, to justice and holding them to account for their actions. Uh, the second or secondly, Egypt also made such uh, a just remedy or compensation for the terrorist uh, uh, victims. Uh, in the same regard, yes, sir. In the, in, in the same regard, Egypt actually uh, uh, helping the victims in different areas. And finally, I would I'll also 
remember that or uh, mention that Egypt is still trying to eradicate the roots of uh, terrorism in Egypt via media, cultural outlets, uh, uh, legislations, uh, uh, outreach, uh, uh, etc. Thanks a lot, sir. I finished. Thank you, um, uh, Eamon Salama. Thanks a lot for that elaborate uh, discussion and your your speech. Um, I would now request, first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Carmen and uh, Dr. Bacon for the first session. Fantastic deliberations and brilliant uh, responses. I would now request Abhinav to transition to the next session. We're formally done with this and thank you for all the participants for your questions and for just being patient. Thank you. Over to Abhinav.